Well, good morning. It's great to be here. You know, the church has always had this regular rhythm of gathering and scattering and doing ministry in the world, and we're just continuing that. And we're gathered here this morning, and sure, it looks a little different. You look great in your PJs with your messed up hair. I love the look. You're all looking great. You got your bagel with you, your coffee, and we're here to worship together. So it might look different. It might feel different, but really, we're the church gathered together at a special time. So what you're going to experience this morning is basically what we'd experience every morning. We're going to gather. We're going to sing these songs. We're going to praise Jesus. We're going to hear the word preached, and we're going to celebrate that uh, spring is here, life is here, and Jesus is a part of all of that. So I just want to lift up these, uh, these words from Psalm 20, verses 6 and 7. It says this, Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I prove our trust in, not in horses or chariots or anything like that. Place our trust in Jesus, a name that is above all names. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You are the word at the beginning, one with God.
beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. We didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you Let's pray together, and at the end of the prayer, I'll invite you to join me in the Lord's Prayer like we pray every week. Let's pray. Loving God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're so grateful that in the midst of these challenging and rapidly changing times, that you never change. You invite us to trust in you, to find our hope in you, to rest in you. Today, that's challenging, but we're trying. Thank you for your peace that passes all understanding. We pray that your peace would encompass our hearts and minds. We're so grateful for the many people in our congregation who are finding ways to serve and to help, to encourage and to pray. Help us to live our lives in such a way that in six months we will look back and realize that we brought glory and honor to Jesus and many saw the kingdom of God in action because of the way we spoke and acted. We pray for a slowing and a stopping of the spread of this coronavirus. We pray for all those who are currently sick with it, particularly those who are in life-threatening situations. We pray for those who live in fear of contracting it. Would you wrap your loving arms around them? We lift up to you all of the first responders, medical personnel, nursing home aides, and all those who put themselves on the front lines because they are caring for people. We're grateful for the supermarket employees and the restaurant workers and the gas station attendants and others who are open and serving us. Keep them from this disease. We pray for all those who have lost their jobs, for those who are concerned about their companies closing and them losing their jobs. We pray for families whose kids are at home and they're running out of ways to keep them occupied. God, would you enable perfect behavior sibling love and toleration, hours of self-occupation, and for this ultimately to be a rich family time. We pray for people in poverty all over the world, 
As stressful as this is for us, we recognize that there are many dealing with situations we cannot even imagine. And we pray for those who know they are blessed, but are also dealing with great disappointment. There are spring sports that will never be played, families who have lost loved ones who cannot grieve together, weddings that were planned and now are postponed, graduations that will not occur as planned, and friends that didn't get to say goodbye before they left. We pray for all those who are sad. Help us to be concerned for our neighbors, to look out for one another, to be encouragers on social media, and to continue to grow closer to Jesus. And now we pray in the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are going to continue in our sermon series. And um, the reason we're going to do that is because I talked to a number of people and I said, would it be weird if we just continued on with our sermon series? Should I talk about something else? Should I talk about encouragement or resting in God? which I'm doing throughout the week and we're publishing a lot of other ways. And to a person, they said to me, keep going with the sermon series. It'll give us something else to think about and something else to talk about. And so that's what we're doing this morning. And so the question that we're dealing with this morning is, what, have God, what does God think of war? Uh, a number of years ago, it was in 2014, my family and I went to visit my sister-in-law, Megan's sister, who lives in Berlin, Germany. And they live in a lovely old house. It was built in the uh, mid-20th centuries, right near the Tempelhof Airport. Uh, Tempelhof Airport was familiar, uh, was famous for the Berlin airlift, but it was also a huge Nazi propaganda site before. It's where Hitler staged lots and lots of um, Nazi marches and rallies, and the area around it was bombed fairly heavily, as you might imagine. Uh, one day, we met um, my sister-in-law's neighbors, really, really kind people, and we just got to talking about life, and I don't know how we got talking about world conflict, but we did. And this woman said to me so emphatically, no more war, never war again. And I guess we were talking about Russia because she said, give Putin whatever he wants, but I never want to live through war again. And this was a woman who lived in this neighborhood during World War II. And I was so impacted by that, by what she had to say, by her desire to never have to see that kind of destruction, that kind of death, that kind of mayhem unleashed again. But there might be some of you who are sitting here, who are listening and saying, well, that's ridiculous. That's what Neville Chamberlain said at the beginning of the Second War. Just give Hitler whatever he wants, but we don't want to have any more war. And look what that got us into. And this brings up the first point that I want to make. I think in most subjects that we deal with, but particularly in this one, we all bring assumptions to the table about whether war is good, whether war is bad, war maybe we think is never justified, maybe at core we are pacifists because of some of our religious beliefs. Maybe we think that war is frequently justified to make sure that the right thing happens. Or maybe we believe that war can sometimes be justified. I know for me, I've changed my view over the years. Um, I remember one time, it was when I was uh, getting ready, to, uh, well, I was probably going to be a senior in college, and I came up for a scholarship that we had to go and do a speech on. And at the time, there was one conflict or another down in Central America, and uh, I believed that we had some national interest there, but honestly, I don't remember what the problem was now. I don't know that it rose to the level of, you know, epic good versus evil, but I knew that I felt we had a national interest one way. And in the speech that I had to give, I said this, I think we should send the Marines in there and wipe them all out and just be done with it. And at the time, 
I thought that that was a reasonable and rational solution. And now I look at it, and frankly, I'm embarrassed because it recognized none of the nuances in the situation and frankly really relied more on the doctrine of might makes right than it did on any other thing. And I've changed quite a bit about how I think about war. And if I'm really honest, this has been a wonderful exercise for me to really kind of nail down what I think about war. And maybe it will be that for you too. Because at that time, when I, when I said that we should just send the Marines in and wipe everybody out, it was in the national interest. I don't know if it was in the global interest. And I don't know if national interest is just good enough. And I kind of think that if God agrees with all of your politics, you've created God in your image. And I think now I'm realizing more than ever, even during this coronavirus outbreak, that there's a necessity for us to be global citizens. We're learning that right now. We have to be concerned about how things affect people globally, not just about our own tribe. And so as we think about those things, I want to deal with a couple of passages that deal with war in the Bible. And I'm going to go to the most controversial example of war in the Bible. And it's mentioned a couple of times, but I'm going to pick the one out of Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 and 18. And it is in that time where the Exodus is over and God is having his people basically clear out the land of Canaan. This is what it says, Deuteronomy 16, 18. As for the towns of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as a special possession. Destroy every living thing in them. You must completely destroy the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you. This will keep the people of the land from teaching you their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. So they're going into what is now the land of Israel. It's called Canaan at the time. It was occupied by a bunch of different people. And what I want us to think about for a moment, though, is all of these funny sounding names, Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, they're all people. They weren't just funny sounding names in some joke. I mean, we're talking about people groups that God is saying, I'm giving you this land. These people are there. And so I want you to go and completely wipe them out. And so what is this genocide that the Bible talks about? It's passages like this that make people wonder, are there two gods in the Bible? Is there an angry Old Testament God who somehow gets excited about wiping people he doesn't like off of the face of the earth? And then this loving New Testament God in Jesus. I mean, it, it looks on a surface comparison like you have two very different gods that are represented in the Testaments. First of all, we have to fundamentally reject the notion that there is more than one God. I mean, the, the foundation of our faith is rooted way down in Judaism. And in Judaism, every observant Jew every day multiple times says the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Our belief in God is rooted in this oneness of God. There are not a multiple gods. There is only one. And as New Testament believers, we believe in one God, eternally existent in three people, not three gods, still only one God. So if there's only one God, and you have a God who seems to behave differently in the two uh, Testaments, how do we reconcile those passages? How do we reconcile this, what seems like genocide in the Old Testament versus all the love that Jesus talks about in the New Testament? Well, anytime we have a conundrum like this, we have to go back and we have to start with, what do we know about God? So here's a couple of things that we know about God, that we are created in his image. We're created to be like him. We know that God created us to be in relationship with him. We know that God loves us and we know that God loves all of us. We know that God doesn't want any of us to go down to destruction that God wants all of us to be saved. 
And we know that God is restoring all things and wants everything to be made new. So now let's go back with what we know about God and let's look at this passage. Because this passage that God is talking about is in some ways very unique in the time of human history because of what God is attempting to do. So a little bit of salvation history for you. So we believe that at the beginning of time that everything was the way that it should be. And sin entered into the garden and entered into our hearts and broke everything. Uh, it broke our relationship with God, it broke our relationship with one another, and was the, the, the cause of all the pain and the suffering and war and death and disease that are on the earth today. And immediately after we break this fellowship with God, immediately after we sin, God puts in this plan of salvation. And so God chooses a group of people so that through them he might bless the entire world. He chooses Israel and he wants to have a special relationship with them. He will be their God, they will be his people, so that they can portray to the rest of the nations who God is and what God is doing, and they will help God in his plan of salvation. And so this is where we're at in God's plan, which then goes on, Israel doesn't work out so well, so it goes, out, it goes on to be Jesus, the one perfect Israelite, but that's for another sermon. But we're in the, the, this process of the salvation story where God is bringing out a group of people for himself. And he wants them to be a unique people. And he gives them this land. And he sets them off on the course of war. Now, there are many, I think, unacceptable reasons for war. Imperialism, financial gain, religious difference, family feuds, racial arrogance, on and on. There are many unacceptable motives for war. But there is one time, biblically, when war is condoned and when it is used by God, and that is wickedness. It's in confronting evil. And so when the Israelites are called into battle, Moses gives them these instructions out of Deuteronomy 9. After the Lord your God has done this for you, don't say to yourself, the Lord has given us this land because we are so righteous. No, it's because of the wickedness of the other nations that he is doing it. And if you remember the passage that we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 20, it's brought up after to, to wipe these people out. The reason is because this will keep the people of the land from teaching you their detestable customs in the worship of their gods, which would cause you to sin deeply against the Lord your God. He's trying to protect his people from sin. He's trying to protect his people from being dragged down into the wickedness that these other nations are participating in. So can people grow so wicked that God justifiably destroys them? I mean, can leaders be so evil and so cruel that God, knowing the hardness of their hearts, righteously removes them from the earth? And the answer is, apparently so. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. It happened with all the people that were just named. And there might even be a couple of instances in more recent history where you can think of people and movements that might have followed into, uh, fallen into that category. Apparently, there is a line that can be crossed. And it is always about evil and wickedness. But here's the thing. It's not just the Hivites and the Jebusites and all of those people. God promises to do the same thing to his people too. In Jeremiah chapter 5, God says this, O Israel, I will bring a distant nation against you, says the Lord. It is a mighty nation, an ancient nation, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you cannot understand. Their weapons are deadly. Their warriors are mighty. They will eat your harvests and your children's bread, your flocks of sheep and your herds of cattle. Yes, they will eat your grapes and figs, and they will destroy your fortified cities, which you think are so safe. And so this is an instance of because of the wickedness of God's people, where he is going to bring judgment upon them by the Babylonians and the Assyrian Empire in order to punish them for what they've done. 
So apparently there are moments where wickedness or pure evil seem to be a justification for war. But even in the midst of that, the Bible longs for peace. God is a God of peace. One of the titles that Jesus is given is Prince of Peace. It always seems in the Bible that war is the last resort. One of the most moving moments I have ever had is when I was spending a lot of time in Israel. We used, I used to take people up to the very northern border of the country. And you can literally stand at a chain link fence uh, that is fairly heavily fortified, but a, a fence that divides Israel from Lebanon. And you can look from the north of Israel into the Baca Valley of Lebanon, which was at one time one of the bread baskets of the Roman Empire. And on a plaque set up at a little site there so that you can see it as you look out is this quotation from Isaiah 2. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up war against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That's the hope that God has. That's what God is leading us toward. Where we don't have need anymore for weapons of war and instead make them implements of farming. In fact, I think roughly the second half of the Old Testament is God's warning about impending judgment on his people that he's going to bring upon them if they don't turn back. Most of the minor prophets, most of the major prophets are all about God saying, come back, come back, come back. That's always the call of God. And when the Babylonians roll through, it's because the people of God did not come back. Then we go to the New Testament. And so let's look at some of the things that Jesus said. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This sounds like Jesus is, is turning this up, upside your head, you know, that we should only love our enemies, that there should never be any conflict. And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. I think what Jesus is talking about is what goes on inside of our own hearts. Jesus doesn't want us to hate anyone. God doesn't hate anyone. And one of the reasons that hate is so toxic is because the people that hate affects most is the people who hate. If we hate people, it changes us. And we then can justify doing all sorts of ungodly things. Hate makes us do bad things. And so what Jesus is not saying is you can never have an enemy. What Jesus is saying is guard your heart. Be careful who you hate. But then in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't, say, doesn't Jesus quoting the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill? No. No, he doesn't. Not really. Because both the word in the Old Testament in the Ten Commandments and what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is the word for murder. Thou shalt not murder. And that's different from killing. I love this, this passage from C.S. Lewis. I don't agree 100% with everything, but as always, Lewis does such a nice job. Lewis says, does loving your enemy mean not punish him, punishing him? No, for loving myself does not mean that I ought not to subject myself to punishment, even to death. If you had committed a murder, the right Christian thing to do would be to give yourself up to the police and be hanged. It is, therefore, in my opinion, perfectly right for a Christian judge to sentence a man to death or a Christian soldier to kill an enemy. I always have thought so ever since I became a Christian, and long before the war, the Second World War is what he's talking about. And I, still think, and I still think so now that we are at peace. It is no good quoting, thou shalt not kill. There are two Greek words, the ordinary word to kill and the word to murder. And when Christ quotes that commandment, he uses the murder one in all three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'm told there is the same distinction in Hebrew. All killing is not murder, any more than all sexual intercourse is adultery. When soldiers come to John the Baptist asking what to do, he never remotely suggested that they ought to leave the army. 
nor did Christ when he met a Roman sergeant major, what they called a centurion. The idea of the knight, the Christian in arms for the defense of a good cause, is one of the great Christian ideas. War is a dreadful thing, and I can respect an honest pacifist, though I think he is entirely mistaken. C.S. Lewis might overstate the case, and like I said, I don't agree with everything he said, but I think he sums up well a good way to look at the difference between murder and killing. And so, perhaps then, the biggest question really is, why are you considering going to war? What has brought one nation to the brink of fighting another war? And James has a real caution about this. James chapter 4, verse 1. James writes, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And so there, there are some very serious comments there about what leads us to war. We fight, we quarrel because of our internal struggles for our desires. We desire stuff that we do not have, we covet. And so we want to take those things from other people. We trust in ourselves. That's what it means when it says you do not have and you do not ask God. We don't ask God to provide for our needs. We think we need to get it ourselves. And sometimes that leads us to do things that are painful and cause damage to other people. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And so James lifts up our motivation. James lifts up whether we are fighting a war or considering fighting a war or even just interpersonal relationships based on selfish desires or coveting what somebody else has or because we have taken our focus off of God and just put it on our wants. So those are some very real things that we need to think about when we think about whether war is justified or not. Uh, two of the greatest thinkers in the history of the church spent a lot of time thinking about this. Um, and they came up with what's been called the, the just war doctrine. It really began with St. Augustine, of course, because all good things begin with Augustine, and then was, uh, was really fine-tuned uh, by Thomas Aquinas. And the, the basic idea behind the just war is, in order for a war to meet the biblical standards of it being okay, and we've already talked about what those are. It's about confronting evil. It's about confronting wickedness. It's not just about lusting for what somebody else happens. And they kind of boiled down decent categories for war as, is it a just cause? Is it righteous? Are you doing it with the right intention or the wrong intention? Is it from a legitimate authority? Is it the state waging war or is it a vigilante group? Does it have due proportionality? I mean, did, did they you know, throw a stick and you're tossing a nuclear missile? Proportionality. And number uh, five, is it the last resort? Because that's what we always see from God. It's always the last resort. And so what this lays out, what the Bible I think lays out, is that there are some reasonable options that we have to think about. There's some things that we have to pray through, that we have to check our motives on. There's all sorts of things that need to happen, negotiation, diplomacy, maybe economic sanctions, who knows what else, before we even consider the possibility of whether a war might be right. That's what I've come to this week about what God thinks about war. So let me ask you a couple of questions. The first is, What's the assumption you bring to the table about war? Do you come in believing that war is always justified or that war is never justified or that war can be justified sometimes? The second question, in what ways can you be a voice of peace? Even if it might end up in war, what are the ways that you can speak peace into a tense situation? Number three, what for you seems to be good reasons to go to war. And would God think so too?
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. It's great. So we pour out our praise, pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken it's great In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth. As we finish with our worship service today, it's been a great opportunity to connect with one another and to be together, even though we're spread out. It's a great example that church ain't a building, uh, that we are the people of God dispersed around the world, doing the work of God as the church in the world. And so today, as I leave you, I want to pronounce the benediction, but I want to use the most ancient one in the Bible. This benediction is about 3,000 years old. When the priesthood was established, God said to Aaron, bless the people with these words. So receive these words that have blessed God's people for 3,000 years. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.